Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show today, we have Tim Husnudinov. We have uh, <laughs> Doug Barbieri. Even better. <laughs> I've been working on that name for how oh, low these many years. years. Finally, I get it right. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and uh, libertarians are kind of celebrating to a little bit of a certain extent here in, in California. Since the open primary, it's been very difficult to get on the general election ballot because the primary is in California. It's an open primary, which means under the California system that in order to get to the general election, you have to be in the top two vote getters in the primary election. And every voter can vote for whatever candidate in whatever party, in whatever race, uh, regardless. So in other words, if you're, a, if you're a Democrat, you can vote for a Democrat in every race, or if you want to vote uh, for the Republican that you think would be the easiest to beat, you can vote for him in the Republican race. Uh, you can vote for whoever you want to. So we, we end up with uh, situations in this highly Democrat state where two Democrats get on the ballot. It happened with uh, Dianne Feinstein and uh, De Leon are, are running, uh, two Democrats running in the general election for Senate. Two Democrats. Well, they won the two. They were the two top. The top two. For a libertarian to get into the top two, one of two things has to happen. Either you have to have an extremely incompetent par, uh, Republican or Democrat, depending on the district, or you have to have an uncontested race in which a, 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 a libertarian says, "Yeah, I think I'll do that." Or a, a third option is in an uncontested, or I should say, a, a nonpartisan race. And we have six libertarians who filled one of those. Uh, slots in the uh, elections last Tuesday. Uh, six Libertarians advanced. Uh, they include Libertarian Party Chair uh, Honor Mimi Robson. She placed second against uh, Democrat incumbent Patrick O'Donnell in the uh, California Assembly, District 7, uh, 70. She got a respectable 17 percent of the vote. Uh, and this was in a four-person race. In fact, she beat out another Democrat who was running uh, in, the pri in that primary, as well as a Green uh, Party candidate. Yeah. So she set a record by being the first libertarian uh, since Top Two was enacted in 2010 to beat uh, another Democrat or Republican in, a, in the uh, Top Two primary race. Great. So yeah. uh, congratulations to, uh, to Mimi. In a hotly contest contested uh, nonpartisan, uh, five-way or four-way, uh, oh, five-way, five-way race yeah, sure. for Riverside County Board of Supervisors. The mayor of Calamisa, a guy by the name of uh, of uh, Jeff Hewitt, probably the best libertarian politician in the state of California. Jeff Hewitt uh, placed second in the primary. He'll go uh, to the general election for County Board of Supervisors in Riverside County, and he'll probably win. This, this guy uh, has it together. He'll, he'll probably win outright come November. Uh, and then we have the write-in candidates. Now, write-in candidates happen when, whenever you've got a, an uncontested race. You can register to be a write-in candidate, and if you get uh, one vote and nobody else does, you are uh, going to the, uh, to the general election. And write-in candidates include uh, Justin Quigley, who's a, a cowboy from Central, Tech, or Central California, Central Valley. Uh, he uh, ran uh, against uh, uh, Democrat Adam Gray in the 21st Assembly District, and he, he will pro proceed to, to, the, uh, to the general election. Also, Autumn Brown will proceed to the uh, general election. She's uh, uh, opposing Democrat Tom Daley in the uh, Assembly District 69 down in Southern California. Oh, wow. Now, Autumn is, is an interesting person because yeah. she is the daughter of a uh, libertarian presidential candidate back in 2000 and 1996, Harry Brown. So Harry Brown's daughter is, uh, is uh, following in, in dad's footsteps, yeah. and we, we salute her for doing so. Absolutely. She's in the game. Uh, a third libertarian writing candidate to, to qualify is Chris Stair. He ran against Democrat Wendy Carrillo in Assembly District uh, 51. And uh, an interesting thing happened in uh, Senate District, uh, California Senate District 26 uh, down south. Uh, Baron Bruno uh, was planning on running and had uh, announced in the district that he was going to run. Uh, and then another libertarian filed also. And, and you know, anybody can file if it wants to. It's an open primary. So another libertarian filed in a, 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 a race that Baron had run in you know, fairly, uh, uh, fairly strongly uh, in the past. And Baron said, no, I'm not going to take this sitting down. So he filed as, uh, as no party preference and came in second. He's a strong, long-time libertarian, but he came in second to proceed to the general election in November. 
Now, all six uh, candidates, all six libertarian candidates, have an uphill battle to to run to uh, between now yeah. for the next five months to actually yeah. make a, make a showing or even maybe even a win uh, in November. I think Chris Hewitt will do it. Maybe some maybe some of the other ones will. Thoughts? Uh, this is definitely uh, great to see. Um, not used to seeing this kind of uh, success, at least in the in the first part of the primaries. Um, what I can say is. We've had the privilege in Yolo County to have a fairly libertarian supervisor, uh, Matt Rex Road, serving, uh, but he won't be serving anymore. He's stepping down. He has his own consulting firm. Um, the the interesting part is uh, uh, living and, and working in, in policy, especially cannabis policy in Yolo County, but with with uh, someone who's very strongly libertarian philosophically, not necessarily registered with the party or running uh, as, as a member of the party. It's a nonpartisan is, issue. Right, yeah, right. uh, uh, is, is that when certain decisions come for greater regulation to allow for industry to continue because we're forced to follow those rules, whether it's taxes uh, or more fees, anything like that that creates additional structure and barriers but still allows for businesses to continue more difficultly, but uh, that's the case. It's, it's, uh, the vote usually is, um, is a solid no. So sometimes uh, in the past we've had uh, uh, situations where we need something to pass even though we're philosophically opposed to it, but the business community, the industry comes together and says we need this to pass. Um, and in order to do business Right, well. right, right. And then, and then the principal vote, uh, whether someone like Rex Road sits on the Board of Supervisors or not, is usually a no, opposed to any and all increases in taxes and regulation. Um, and that's kind of been an interesting dance to, to participate in. Um, because you, it's, a, it's a dichotomy. One side of you has very strong beliefs philosophically. The other one, looking for more, I don't want to use this word in, in, in comparison to our, our philosophical beliefs, but practical applications for, for, for the businesses and being forced to choose something that we normally be opposed yeah, that's to. That's interesting. I, uh, Jeff Hewitt <coughs> is, was a practical mayor of Calamisa. Calamisa is a small town in Southern California in the, in the uh, greater LA uh, urban area. And he decided, or Orange County, I, I guess it would be, he decided uh, to run for mayor of Calamisa, won, and they had a huge pension problem, particularly mm. with the firefighters union uh, and CalPERS. It was vastly underfunded, uh, driving the city into, into bankruptcy. So he successfully separated his fire department from CalPERS and set up his own fire department uh, free from the state regulations and the state rules and so forth that made it very, very difficult to uh, to uh, fund the uh, the union negotiated pensions. Uh, and did so successfully, and now he's planning on taking that same uh, success story to the uh, to the County Board of Supervisors, which has, uh, Riverside County has the same pension problems that, uh, that Calamisa did. Would you say that, that he privatized the, the, the no, firefighters? No, he didn't privatize or? it, but he, 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 he took it out of the control of the, of the state. Okay. Uh, decentralized. Over, over, yeah, decentralized, right. Uh. And, uh, you know, and, and decentralization means greater control. It mm -hmm. means less... Uh, being, uh, less being forced to kowtow to yes. the unions who, yes. of course, want these uh, very uh, oh, rich yeah. uh, pension programs. Uh, uh, you know, never mind no amount of money can be yeah. too much and no, uh, yeah. bankrupt the city. That's yeah. not a problem. Never mind. That's, that's not a problem. Pensions no, are all Small all details. Yeah. 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 So, you know, so practical politics uh, is something that libertarians can actually make, a, make headway with. Well, you know, also, it's, it's, I mean, I don't put that much stock in voting myself. Um, because I think it's just like moving faces around in offices. But the important thing, and this is what I liked about the Ron Paul <coughs> campaign, is that he got certain words into the lexicon. He got people talking. And, and so the more libertarians that we have in these kinds of positions, they will start to say things that, you know, these are, these are, these are terminologies and things that will start ringing true with people. Um, like there was a, uh, I read an article about, um, I forget the names, but the guy was talking about, he was, a, he was, he was, had this debate, this libertarian was having this debate with this Obama supporter and <clears throat> who was like writing articles and things like that. And then lo and behold, one day he said, well, I'm, I stand for regulation, but I think regulation should reduce, when, in enforcing the regulation, we should reduce the harm done by the state against, and it was like, he was like, whoa, you're, you're using my language. Even though he still was for regulation and he still was, you know. Well, I mean, yeah. when you get right down to yeah. it, regu regulation is necessary. It can be self-regulation, or it can be industry regulation, or it can be government regulation, or it can be you know regulation at the government level with a you know with with a very very difficult, uh, uh, impossible to work with bureaucrats, or it can be mm -hmm. regulation that is designed to make businesses work 
better. Oh. Uh, you know, there's, there's you're going to end up using the word it. either way, right? You yeah. just, you just want to put the ball in your court yeah, and exactly. define the debate. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. the word regulation, yeah, it's a, well, I mean, like the... It's not an inherently evil word. No, it's like even like in the Second Amendment, the word regulation is used, but what does it mean? It just, it just means... Um, Aim at what you're shooting at. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> it, mean, it, it means that it's, it, it's structured, you know, it, it, it uh, it conforms to certain standards. That's really all it means. And whether who's doing the regulation, right. who's structuring, who's you, doing you the for your own life you or someone else, who knows want, better? Do you want politicians and bureaucrats to do it, or you know? Well, <laughs> and, and I mentioned the, the pension situation in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in California and in Southern California in particular. Uh, pensions throughout the country are, are turning into a, 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 a hairy uh, problem. And uh, that's not only at the government level, but that's also at the private level. I mean, Social Security is bankrupt by 1934. Uh, <coughs> Medicare is bankrupt by 1926, I think they're saying now. Uh, and CalPERS, I'm not sure what the date is, but they're, they're underwater. State, uh, I mean, uh, local uh, city pensions, uh, uh, Vallejo went bankrupt because of pension problems. So did Stockton, so did uh, San Bernardino, so did uh, uh, Mammoth Lakes. All kinds of places, all over. The, Chicago's got problems. Illinois's mm. got problems with pensions. There, are, Dallas, Davis. Dallas has problems. Davis, okay, I don't no, know. No, that, no, that's no, there, there are true. problems with pensions yeah. wherever you look. And one of the problems with pensions is the fact that the number of pensioners, because w people my age are living longer, we're embracing the singularity. How about that? Uh, and uh, accepting pensions, taking our money, and people <coughs> your age. Are, there's less of you, there are fewer of you, so that the ratio of earning people, working people, to pensioners is, is decreasing all the time. Right. At the same time, we're saying we can't have any more working people in the form of immigrants because, well, hey, they'll take our jobs. Right. <laughs> I'm an immigrant, and I'm a working person, and I, I'm an entrepreneur, <laughs> and, and I'm a jobs, business owner. And you're creating jobs for other people. Yeah. Bringing us to the next topic. That, was a, nice, that was a nice segment. ICE I agents like offered donuts to workers in a Sandusky, Ohio flower shop before pulling a SWAT style raid where they arrested 114 14. workers in the flower yep. uh, and garden shop on immigration charges. Oh, yeah. And they're, they're, uh, they're these just, are people yeah. who are. I'm going to guess that there's probably not a whole lot more than 114 employees in this shop. That's a big shop <laughs> for a flower shop. Uh, and, and, you know, so uh, what, what's, what's going on here? Why in the world uh, are we listening to the likes of Trump when it comes to immigration policy? Well, I think it's a fear-based thing. Um, when it, <clears throat> basically, it sounds good to say, oh, protect my job, because, you know, you're afraid of losing your job. Everyone's always afraid of losing your job, their jobs. What people don't really understand is, like, who's the person that actually owns your job? Do you own the job, or does your employer own the job? It's not your job. You know, this is, this is a privilege for you to come and work for this person. And, you know, they have the ultimate say. Well, they don't think of it that way. They think, well, we have to protect American jobs. So that's, Trump is appealing to that sentiment because people are scared, you know, that they're losing their jobs and, uh, or they will lose their jobs. Um, they're trying to hold on to what's theirs. It's understandable, but it's still completely wrong. And you can see this is the logical result of that kind of thinking. I think he's trying to show that he is a decisive person, that it's not just all talk, and he's tough, right? We get a lot of the tough on I'm crime. tough, I can kick right. mice. Right, so the few decisions I can make, I'll show you, I'll really go at it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, to, and to have people like Sessions under I him. I kick dogs and kittens on him. Yeah. I'm a big guy. Right. Take action. He's a very yeah. strong man. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt about that, so. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, yeah, this is low-hanging fruit going after these people. <laughs> That's, that's just awful. I, I wonder if the, if the folks bringing the donuts in were, were a uh, sympathetic contingent of, of the uh, raiding party, so to speak, and they wanted to show their condolences. Good cop, good cop, bad cop. Right. I think it was like, totally Please, sure that nobody, please enjoy this nobody, before. Nobody ran yeah. before they were able to uh, close the back door. And right. That's my guess. Or a distraction, yeah. Some people did get away. I think some people got tipped off and didn't come to work that day. Yeah. There hmm. were a few of them. But uh, no, the people that didn't see it coming, they were caught unawares. You know. It's interesting. Uh, over the years, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, campaign funders and, and billionaire class people that the left <coughs> loves to hate mm. have consistently been in favor of open immigration. Consistently been in favor of reforming yes. criminal justice laws. Yes. And uh, now David Koch is retiring. David Koch has been ill with uh, 
uh, he had uh, prostate cancer uh, up as long as 20 years ago. I'm not sure if that's why he's had to take a leave of absence and retire from his uh, role at Coke Industries and Coke affiliated organizations or if it's something else. But he has retired. And I happen to have had a personal interaction with David Koch years ago. Back yeah, in nice 1980, yeah. he uh, ran for vice president along with Ed Clark on the Libertarian Party ticket. That was when the Libertarian Party was eight years old. He was the, uh, the third Libertarian vice presidential candidate. Nice. Uh, he funded the campaign with a million dollars for uh, in campaign contributions, which you could do if you're the candidate. You can't right. contribute uh, that nearly uh, you know anywhere near that amount of money to somebody else's campaign. Yeah, but you can do it. But you can self fund your own money. Yeah. That's true still today. So he contributed a million dollars to the campaign, ran as vice president, but was not just contributing money. He was also on the ground actually running and campaigning uh, in Wisconsin, where I lived at the time. Uh, he flew into Milwaukee. I picked him up at the airport. Wow. I went to a press conference, and uh, I set up the press. I was working basically as his advance man and driver. Nice. And I set up the press conference. He did well with the, you know, well with the press. I drove him from Milwaukee to Madison. This was during the Carter era. You guys are too younger, probably weren't even born yet. Oh, but during 91. the Carter era, no, I, Carter I, era, you I'm could not drive not faster than 55 I was, I on was, the highway. Yeah. 55 was the speed limit. I was around when the 55 law was still Ostensibly to save gas. Yeah. Oh yeah, fuel. it was awful. Uh, I'm yeah. actually older than you think. Uh, anyway, I had my license to you, drive back yeah, in those days. Yeah. You, anyway, op, you opted out of that, of course, that yeah. suggestion. Yeah. Well, right? well, <laughs> what I did is no. I did not want to get a third or a fourth speeding ticket. So I drove 55 miles per hour from Milwaukee to Madison, Ooh, about 90 miles. Painful. David Koch was not happy with <laughs> no <laughs> with driving 55 no. miles per hour. No. He explained to me that he had a Kansas driver's license, which he showed to cops in New York, and uh, you know he, he didn't care how many tickets he ran up on his Kansas driver's license. <laughs> Ah, wow! Because they didn't have reciprocity back then, right? Right. And nobody knew. So <laughs> the good old days. He just didn't drive in Kansas. He didn't need to do that often anyway. Anyway, that's just kind of a, a side story. He came to Wisconsin, or he came to, to Madison, did another press conference in Madison, and then we had a, a, a candid reception at my house that evening. And he, you know, was a kind and generous and gracious uh, person to all of the local uh, libertarian. Uh, people that came to the reception and who decided to party afterwards. He was sleeping in my spare bedroom, or trying to sleep, while the party was going on. He didn't participate in the party? Uh, only up until a certain time. Okay. Yeah, he's trying to, yeah. <laughs> he was on the How responsible of him. Yeah, he but uh, I have out. to say, he never complained the next morning. That's nice. This is a, this is a, a very, a very uh, kind, generous, and uh, uh, civil kind of a, a, a person. Not to mention, of course, the fact that even though he left the Libertarian Party, he's always been a Libertarian, along with his brother Charles. They've supported Libertarian causes, including well, uh, Mises Institute, Institute for Justice, uh, including uh, Young Americans for Young Liberty, Americans for Liberty, Liberty, for Liberty. Liberty. Uh, Institute for Humane Studies, yeah. the Mercatus Center, at, yeah. uh, at uh, all kinds of uh, Libertarian he helped, uh, he helped Murray Rothbard out a lot in, in the he, early he, days. He, yeah. If there's a Libertarian organization, he yeah. probably helped at one time or another. Well, uh, Mises Institute. Institute. Drug policy yeah. too. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 This, this is a guy, yeah. you know, and it wasn't just Libertarian causes. Mm -hmm. As a result of right. knowing a little bit about prostate cancer, he is one of the major funders for cancer research all across the country. Yeah. Uh, he's a, a big fan of, of the arts. He is, a, a, you know, one of the major philanthropists when it comes to uh, funding for the fine arts. Uh, this is truly a renaissance man. And, and, and I, I want to say all of these things. Right. You know, a lot of times people who support the libertarian movement or support a, a good cause of any kind, none of that gets said until it's said in their obituary. No. I want to make sure it gets said before it has to yeah. be said in an obituary. So that's why I'm saying it now. Well, no, that's very important because no, he is persona non grata with uh, particularly some of my liberal friends who they blame. They say it's a Koch brothers conspiracy. Well, he, he is the he is the, <laughs> the guy to hate. He is the George Soros for the left. Yeah, and George Soros is hated by the right, rightly or wrongly. Uh, the Koch brothers are hated rightly or wrongly. Well, mostly wrongly by the left because he, in fact, supports the ACLU and gay and marriage. They were they were they were pro gay marriage. Gay marriage from, yeah. from the from the beginning before before yeah. Hillary Clinton or any of the rest of them thought it was cool. Before it was cool. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, in very much in favor of decriminalization of drugs. Very much in favor of yes. criminal justice reform. Yeah. Very much in favor of uh, lowering incarceration rates. I mean, people don't know it, but we have a higher incarceration rate than Russia or China. No, no, it's, 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 it's bad. Per capita, yeah, it's really bad. Per capita bad. basis. Yeah. It's absolutely horrendous what we do to, to, to uh, so 
so-called criminals who really aren't because they're in jail for victimless crimes, marijuana. Well, well that crime. dovetails back to the ICE agents, right? I mean, it's the yeah, victimless yeah. crime. How dare you step over this imaginary line? And that was drawn in sand by yeah. general, long dead generals and politicians. Right. Exactly. It's like anyway. Yeah, so uh, we we wish we wish uh, yeah. David Cook the, the very best. Well, speaking of fleeing. Well, are you ready to flee <laughs> California yet? Uh, people are fleeing California and New York because of tax issues. Tim? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it, it also brings to mind um, uh, what was happening in recent years about uh, businesses leaving California for places like Texas and those states being more than uh, willing to take them on, come on down, right? Um, it's always a challenge living and continuing to live in California and do business in California, you know, having uh, uh, all of the regulations and the taxes to deal with and having to do the finance work, you actually can see all the funds that are being sucked out, right? Uh, for in this case, uh, a lot of it's based around uh, Trump's new Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, right? So uh, we're seeing people leave and c some corporations too because uh, it doesn't do it, uh, the, the cuts, um, it's not a real reform, right? It's a modification of the existing laws. Well, so uh, they got rid of some key deductions, right? Right, right. And, yeah. they, and they, but they do the tiers differently. The the uh, um, the corporate America tier has uh, an effective forty percent tax cut permanent, right? Small businesses like my own uh, get a nine percent effective tax cut until after twenty twenty five. So there isn't a balance there. Um, mm. But also for individuals, uh, it, it, I think it gets even worse. Well, yeah, uh, you get rid they got rid of the, uh, they lower the deduction for property taxes as, a, as a, a federal tax deduction and for state income taxes. So if you have expensive real estate, and if you live in California and, and you own a house, you have expensive real estate. Yeah. Uh, whether you want it to be expensive or not, That's it is. true. Yeah. And, and true. You, can't, you can't deduct any more than, I forget what the number is, but it's, it's, there's, a, there's a cap on how much you can deduct. Yeah. The alternative minimum tax for individuals was not repealed. That was kept in there. Yeah. Um, so they, yeah, there, it's it's not it's not an across the board flat sort of thing that you, you hear the a lot of libertarians uh, say. The effect of the Trump tax cut was that it helps middle America a lot more than Cali than blue America, uh, right. probably by design, uh, <laughs> knowing the tribalism of, of Trump politics, uh, and so people have one more reason to flee California for low tax jurisdictions like Florida or Nevada or Texas. And that's at a federal level, so, it's, so well, I mean, I guess maybe that well, could. Well, state level taxes but, are, of but course. Yeah, are, are bad, and that is in control. Of the I mean, it, it, it's kind of good to have competition between ju political jurisdictions in that regard, because then these, these states can say, hey, come over here, we'll be a little more friendly. And that may give some, put some pressure back on the states where businesses are fleeing, hey, you need to modify your, you know, your tax code and be a little more liberal about things. But We'll see, remains to be seen. Yeah. most politicians in high tax states say, hey, our tax revenues are going down, we need to raise the rate. And that's what they think. It's totally they, counterproductive. They, we're, we're, yeah. California is what, the fifth largest uh, economy, economy in the world? world? Yeah. Well, it's like the well, Imagine how much more growth there would be if we actually did uh, uh, policies that made sense, well, right? If they, they ignore the Laffer curve. They think that if they just uh, um, you know, bump up the taxes, right, that will get more. No, it doesn't work that way. Tim and Doug, I know you guys are followers of the anti political correct. Psychology professor, I think he is from the Jordan, University of Toronto. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Tell me about this guy. I, 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 you know, tell me, tell me why you think he is whatever he is. We'll go half and half. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I discovered him maybe year, year and a half ago. Um, he, he's really taken. Uh, uh, he's been able to to capitalize on the the sharing aspect of multimedia and new media, especially YouTube. Uh, so that's where I got the, the start. It's not like I went out to Toronto and ran into him, right? But uh, w when I was very much involved in advocacy and, and uh, activism for libertarian causes like under uh, Young Americans for Liberty, we find these clips where he's standing his ground completely surrounded by uh, uh, very aggressive and violent uh, uh, PC students, right? People that identify differently. Um, who, on the whole, and, uh, it are not bad people, but they, they had a very vicious and violent streak on them. And you would see this man standing his ground and being able to logically deconstruct everything. Uh, so I thought that was fascinating, but it goes much deeper than that. Um, he, he has an amazing ability to blend uh, 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 old world knowledge, history, and culture well, with mysticism and modern psychology. And he bases a lot of it on uh, Carl Jung. Um, and uh, you, you, you get, you, it's almost impossible to find that kind of eclectic blend of, uh, um, 
of discourse. You see him uh, uh, taping his lectures and his classes, and they, they deconstruct every aspect of life. Um, it's a lot of what he has to say is, is almost spiritually enlivening, um, gi giving some yeah. insight into, into life. Uh, yeah. and, and for myself, I can say this, um, uh, that the older I get and the more we enter this newer age, newer things, right? A lot of uh, media-based <coughs> things, I, I look to the past for answers. I realize that the past doesn't have all the right answers, but we can't know exactly where we're going or how to get there unless yeah. we know where we came from. Kind of the saying yeah. of who we are is who we were. And Jordan Peterson has the, an amazing ability to, to blend all of that, despite all the hate he's been receiving. Well, that's what got my attention. Of I started looking at him uh, from the standpoint, oh, it's a dude that's standing up at the social justice warriors. Hey, that's great. But then you actually start listening to his message. And as you say, you realize the man is incredible. He's like an iceberg. You just saw the tip. And all the things that he actually has to say is the wealth of knowledge. It's actually changed my life. He's got a great book called 12 Rules for Life, which is on my reading list. It's a bestseller. Uh, yeah, and it's a bestseller for a reason. Uh, one of the things he says to young students that are going to run out and change the world, go home and clean your room. And that sounds condescending, but if you go home and you clean your room, that's the one square in your world that is under your control. And if you can't even keep that room straight, how do you expect to modify the world around you, which is incredibly complex? <laughs> you don't even understand. <laughs> so uh, no, he's got uh, some uh, incredible pearls of wisdom. And if you haven't checked him out, I highly recommend that you do. We're not trying to be a spokespeople. Um, it's it's just uh, <laughs> I, 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 we we were we, okay. no 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 we're not the, we're not zealots or anything like that. But, way, yeah. but but, <laughs> but uh, one yeah one of the things I read in the scathing article that was published a few uh, uh, that was published a couple of weeks ago or maybe last week and it was also referencing the recent New York Times article that was trying to deconstruct who he was. All of it in a very negative slant um, was that perhaps no one has. Uh, uh, lived in the modern era quite like Jordan Peterson who has been able to uh, uh, get so much hate but attention too from, from journalists and media folks in the last two years. Uh, it has never really been done well, before the, on that the, scale. The very little exposure I've had to him is that he's a very decent and soft-spoken and uh, respectful person yeah. uh, when he's on the dais. Yeah. And, yeah. and he speaks his truth and he backs it up and he never apologizes for it. Um, and w one more interesting thing I can say is that in his home, he has a bunch of communist propaganda posters around him. He has things that incite emotional responses uh, for meditation purposes, for, for thinking, uh, critical thinking, uh, reminding where humanity has been and where it can go again. Uh, and uh, coming from the Soviet Union myself, I find that kind of stuff fascinating. I may only have two or three posters in my place, but his, his place is sprawling and it creates that tense environment where he can really get down to the brass but tacks no of what Marxist, he needs to do. So don't, he's right, no of course, of course. <laughs> That's the show. I want to talk about the study that says drinking moderately is better than non, not drinking at all, but we'll have to save that for another time. And, and, and for cell phones to listen to That's it. Thank you very much for being part of the show. See you again next week. Same time, same time. We didn't get around to that one, but we wanted to That's talk right. about Dr. Peterson. Peterson was great, right. <laughs> <laughs>